So first what I would like to do is I'll just talk about Botox, Botox itself to you. And then I'll go on to um, talk about it more specifically in uh, how we might use it for certain symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So Botox is, Botox is a neurotoxin, and so um, you know, there's lots of different terms for it. I'm just going to use the general term Botox. So whenever I'm saying Botox, I'm talking about it in general. Botox actually is a, one of the forms of, neuro, of the neurotoxin, but again, um, it's just easier to talk about Botox. So it's one of the most poisonous sub substances known to humans, and a lethal dose as you can see up there, is approximately one nanogram per kilogram body weight. Um, if, an, if someone inhales a gram of it, they'd be, they would die, and a gram technically could kill at least a million people. So it's very powerful stuff. Um, so we found out about, um, it's kind of interesting to hear the history of how we've discovered these things and how it's been, um, come into use. So um, we found out about it by looking at people who had gotten what we would now today call botulism, so, which is poisoning, often a food poisoning, um, that causes uh, a fatal paralytic disease. And it's probably been known ever since humans have stored food. Um, however, in the early 1800s, um, a physician, Dr. Justinius Kerner, was the first one to kind of associate a certain type of food poisoning um, with this. Um, to, with this phenomenon of dying from being paralyzed. So in 1817 or so, he had some publications in which he, um, he figured out that there must be a toxic agent that's causing the paralysis when people go through this food poisoning. And, there, um, and this occurred a lot in outbreaks in Germany where they were making sausage and eating a lot of sausage. So the term botulism actually was coined from the Latin word for sausage, which is botulus. And so it really is, you know, literally sausage poisoning. And so what they found when people were um, eating these sausages in certain batches, um, some of them would get sick and um, die from um, a very quickly progressive descending paralysis. And they would die because their respiratory muscles would become paralyzed. Um, so in a sense, they'd actually suffocate. So um, then, Emilio Pierre-Marie von Ermingen, he is a microbiologist, and he was the one who finally figured out that this was a toxin that was produced by a particular bacteria. And so he was studying these outbreaks of sausage poisoning, and he identified this toxin, and then he identified the um, bacteria responsible for producing it. So it's really not an infection, it's really um, an intoxication because um, this bacteria is producing this toxin at great levels. The toxin um, is not um, deactivated as the food goes through the digestive system. Um, he found that you had to use really high temperatures in order to kill off the toxin. Um, so the bacteria would be killed by our digestive process, but the toxin would remain active, which is why it was so dangerous. Um, so today we know that Clostridium botulinum is found worldwide in soil, dust, and marine sediments. Um, and the most common forms of botulism, so um, the most common types of exposures in improperly preserved food. And so this is usually, um, it has to be, it's not a particularly strong bacteria, so it has to be um, grown in actually certain conditions. And so the process that people use for canning actually it can provide the right environment for this bacteria to thrive if they don't do the canning things properly, like the high enough heats and this sort of thing. Another way um, people get exposed is infants can carry um, spores of the uh, bacteria in their gut if they eat honey. So this is why we're always telling young parents don't feed your kids honey um, because sometimes they'll, their system won't be able to um, um, be able to handle the, the little bit of neurotoxin that might be produced by a little bit of bacteria that's in the honey. And then you can also get exposed to um, Clostridium botulinum through wound contamination. 
So here's a picture of what the toxin looks like under an electron micrograph. And it's an anaerobic bacteria, meaning it grows best where there's um, least, less air than more air. And it has to be at certain pHs and acidities and all this kind of stuff. Um, and the major effect of this toxin is muscle paralysis. So as time went on, of course, finding um, this toxin, it was about the uh, beginning of the 20th century, and so Botox was considered for use as a biologic weapon in World War I and II. It never was used in that way during those two wars. It was found to not be the greatest for a number of reasons. It degrades very easily, and it was actually kind of a fussy bacteria in order to produce the toxin. However, the military put forth a lot of resources to um, look at it as a biologic weapon. And so the, um, oftentimes in medicine, actually, things are developed in the military for kind of you know, weird reasons. And then we get the benefit in medicine because we get to you know, reap the benefits of their initial research. And so they put lots of money and resources into purifying Botox, um, developing it, learning how to handle it, and, and make it in large quantities. And because of that, it eventually became available to us to use in research and for some human use. But it was found to not be the greatest biologic um, weapon. It was just kind of too, too wimpy as a virus. It was too fussy to keep uh, large amounts going. Um, I've always but um, there's always a Wisconsin, a University of Wisconsin connection. And so one of the scientists who was involved in the purification and producing large quantities in the, in the military eventually became a professor here in the Depar Department of Microbiology and Toxicology. So anyways, the go Bucky. So towards medical development, in the early 1970s, people first, they first, they um, were becoming comfortable enough with the toxin that some scientists and physicians were doing experiments in animals where they'd inject the toxin into muscles. And they found that, oh, they could make the injection. It, could, it would stay pretty localized. It didn't spread throughout the whole animal. And so they could cause these areas of weakness in the muscle under pretty controlled situations. So then that led them to thinking of ways to use it in humans. And one, and one of the first uses of it was in treating cross-eyed. So, you know, or strabismus. So when, you know, our eyes need to be aligned and, it, and we have eye muscles that keep our eyes in alignment so that we don't have double vision and that sort of thing. Well, if that, uh, for a variety of reasons, a muscle could be weak or something, and so then people's eyes are misaligned. And they could take the Botox and inject it in certain eye muscles to bring the eye back into alignment. And that was the actual first use of it, and it became FDA approved for that use in 1989. So it's not been around super long in medical use, but long enough that um, we know a lot about it and we're able to use it very safely. Um, to date, there's probably at least 100 plus uses of it, both in medicine as well as cos uh, for cosmetic purposes. And that number's growing and the numbers of toxins and stuff is growing. So it's a big area of development. So, we still use the major effect of it, you're gonna get sick of me saying this, is the effect of the neurotoxin is per paralyzing muscles. And that's what we exploit with the toxin to, and put to good use. So how will it work? So in order to explain this to you, I have to give you a little lesson in anatomy and physiology. Um, so hopefully I won't make that too boring. So. Um, the system that helps us move, of course, is our motor system and muscle system. And this will start um, with, you know, we get the idea we want to move our arm. And so in our motor cortex in the brain, that idea then sends impulses down to lower brain centers and the brain stem down the spinal cord, at which point it's also the signals transmitted to a peripheral nerve that goes to the muscle and tells the muscle to contract. And the muscle, whoop, trying to get too fancy with the slide. So, so there's this interaction at this neuromuscular junction that's very important. And so the signal has to be transmitted from the nerve cell to the muscle. And we need to look at, at that neuromuscular junction a little bit more closely. And normal people, or normally what happens, I should say, is that this nerve fiber comes down into the end of this 
axon, the end of the nerve cell. There's this cleft here called the synaptic cleft, and then there's the muscle here. And so the way the signal gets transmitted is through chemicals. A chemical called acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, will get released. That's what these little green things are. It's held in these little containers called vesicles. And so when the impulse comes down the nerve to move, this activates a whole cascade of molecules here that helps that little vesicle move close to this membrane of the neuron called the presynaptic membrane. It fuses with that membrane so that the contents of those little vesicles is released into the synaptic cleft and then that, and that chemical is acetylcholine. That acetylcholine is then travels across the cleft into receptors on the um, postsynaptic membrane here and then that sends a molecular signal to make that muscle fiber contract. So here it's just kind of some cool pictures. This is a 3D scanning electron microscopic, micros, my, I can't talk, microscopy picture of the nerve fibers and, this, and the, and the uh, muscle. And you can see this is the neuromuscular junction. Um, if you were a scientist and real nerdy like me, you'd think that's really pretty. Um, here's a more typical picture, which is also kind of pretty, of like the muscle fibers are kind of the pinkish, and then they've stained the axon with um, some brown things. And you can just kind of see how that m neuromuscular junction spreads out over the muscle fibers. So there you go. When you're on, yeah, when you're on Jeopardy next, you'll get that neuromuscular junction question right. So th what the Botox does is so is it goes and it interferes with that chemical message. So here's that nerve cell, here's the muscle fiber and that synaptic cleft. And so what it does, this, the signal um, that requires those little vesicles with the acetylcholine in it to travel to that membrane has a whole bunch of little molecules and proteins and they're discovering a new one every week, I swear. But anyways, the Botox will interfere with the function of those proteins and so it attaches to them, inactivates them, so it basically blocks the release of acetylcholine um, before it can get to the synaptic cleft, so it blocks the message from the neuron to the muscle to contract. So, there's at least seven serotypes of Botox. The serotype just kind of refers to the antigenicity of it. It's just kind of a classification. The med for medical uses, we use two of the serotypes. Ty whoops, type A and type B. I told you I was going to be getting used to this thing. Um, and I listed the two that we use at UW most often as on onobotulinum toxin and rhymobotulinum toxin. I usually call it Botox type A and Botox type B. The, Differences among the, there's um, three type A's and one type B's. So that means that we have three of the A serotype. If you develop antibodies to that, which is a risk, we have one other form that we can try. And so there's a lot of research going on trying to find, to make the other serotypes active so that we'd have more choices if people are developing antibodies to these. But the type A ones are all the same. The, the drug reps or uh, manufacturers would tell us, well, they work a little differently with a different protein or a different ang molecular angle, so ours is better than yours and blah, blah. But really, they make no diff it makes no difference. All type A, you know, clinically responds the same, and, and actually the A and B respond pretty similar too. So anyways, so, um, but they'll be coming up with more of these things. It's a big money-producing thing. Um, so the manufacturers are going to be trying to figure out different ways to compete with each other. So we use it, as I said, and keep, um, to treat a variety of conditions in which there's ex um, excessive muscle spasm. However, there's also evidence that Botox affects certain pain receptors, and so it can block pain signals directly in certain circumstances, and so it might have a primary general uh, analgesic effect. Um, so far, when you think of movement of like an arm or a leg, that's your skeletal muscle. It's a certain type of muscle. There's a muscle that works in um, glands and organs called smooth muscle. And we find that some of the, some of the Botox actually acts um, to inhibit um, the smooth muscle as well. So enough about all that. What about Parkinson's disease and when, how we can use it? Um, you know, how would it be a useful tool for some symptoms of Parkinson's? So the main use of it in Parkinson's is for treatment of dystonia. D 
Dystonia is a term that we use for, in a variety of ways, but it really is just a specific type of muscle contraction, an uncontrollable muscle contraction or muscle cramp. And it um, happens, it often happens with a twisting type of phenomenon or results in uh, people with the affected area having an unusual posture. And I'll show you some specific examples of this. And so the first thing we do, we don't jump to Botox, of course, um, but we try to see, well, is this something we can fix with medication? So sometimes a dystonic spasm can be a result of untreated Parkinson's. Sometimes it's the result of the medications and it's considered a form of a dyskinesia. And so we try to figure out how the medicines might um, um, play a role, you know, in the timing of the medicine and when the muscle spasm is occurring. These muscle spasms are quite painful, as unfortunately many of you know all too well. Um, they can also, you know, they prevent you from functioning well, but they can also, if we don't pay attention to them, result in contractures. So let's say I have a spasm of my thumb, where my thumb th wants to stay across my palm. If I never move my thumb out of that position, or if my brain and disease doesn't let me move it out of that position, the, all the soft tissues and tendons and muscles will get shortened, and my thumb will actually get stuck like that and that will be very painful. The joint can even fuse. Um, so we try to avoid that sort of thing from happening by physical therapy and stretches and exercise and stuff, but sometimes that spasm is just so powerful that um, it's very difficult, and that's when we might consider using certain medicines and muscle relaxers, or we, if it's just a very um, focal, focused area, we might decide to see if we can um, attack it with Botox. So there's... Um, um, often you can have spasms of the face or feet or neck or trunk, but anywhere that you have a skeletal muscle, you can have this kind of spasm. Um, so here's some examples. So many people have foot spasms, and there's this thing called a striatal toe. Um, and so what I mean by a striatal toe, and this is um, very common in Parkinson's disease, is that the big toe or great toe sticks up when you don't want it to. So for example, when you take a step with your foot, normally your big toe doesn't do a heck of a lot, but in people who have a striatal toe, every time they bear weight on their foot, that big toe sticks up and it can be painful. It'll rub on their shoe, of course. The other little toes might cramp down in spasm and it's very painful. It's hard to bear weight on it. It disrupts balance, causes people to fall, and it just kind of makes them miserable. Um, this diagram is actually just a, as a teaching diagram from a medical textbook, and they're showing the Babinski sign. I don't know, you know how when you come in for your neurologic exam with us, we tickle the bottom of your foot, and we're watching for a certain reflex. But the striatal toe is almost like inappropriate activation of that reflexive response. So, and the person has no control over that, of course. <laughs> So what we might do then is I know the muscle that makes the big toe extend like that, that's hyperextension of the big toe, and it's this muscle, the extensor hallucis longus here. So that's just below the skin, and so I can usually you know, feel where that muscle is, and I can make little injections of Botox in that muscle. And so that muscle that's overactive will now um, have a more difficult time contracting, and so then I can try to reduce that overactivity down to more normal activity. Or sometimes underactivity in these situations would be desirable too. Um, that, you know, I have to be careful though to get it just in that muscle. If it spreads to the other muscles, I might cause a drop foot or something, so it's, it's tricky um, to get it where you want it and to make it stay there. So that's one example, a common example of when I'm giving Botox injections in the clinic, and it can be very um, helpful for people. Um, the other thing that can happen with Parkinson's disease is people can have something called blepharospasm, and that's just the fancy medical way of saying your eyes spasm shut when you don't want them to. In order to close our eyes, we actually use special muscles to do so. And sometimes those muscles get um, hyperactive. And so someone will, you know how you walk out of the movies into the bright sunlight in your eyes, you want them to be closed? Well, that can happen to people abnormally, like just walking in from like this kind of lighting out to the lobby or wind blowing in their face will make their eyes spasm shut. And so can you imagine driving down the road and your eyes spasm shut even uncontrollably for like 10 seconds. Well, gee whiz, there's a car accident just waiting to happen. And so um, we can use Botox to treat this. 
Um, there's also something called a praxia of eyelid opening in which people, like when they blink, it's almost like they, their brain's forgotten how to open their eyes, and so they'll have difficulty opening their eyes. This gentleman, you can see his, he's kind of squinty-eyed to begin with, and then his eyes are spasming shut, and he has to really make this big effort to open them up. So, and that's very, very disabling, of course, and doesn't respond to medications. It's probably not a result of medications. It's just one of these kind of weird conditions that some people, unfortunately, get with it. So, so what we'll do in those cases is, this is a diagram of the superficial facial muscles and the orbicularis oculi muscle it surrounds the eye, and so I can make injections into that muscle um, and deactivate it so that the, um, it's harder for that person to close their eyes. Um, and it will counteract that hyperactivity. And that can work out really well. So another thing, here's another example of that. P many people, the medications do cause facial dyskinesias. And so it can be facial grimacing or the blepharospasm. This woman, I'll show you a mo her movie, it's kind of short, you'll have to watch and maybe we'll replay it, but she has both blepharospasms, so eye spasms, as well as lower facial spasms. Um, some people will develop grinding of their teeth as a kind of dyskinesia or dystonic spasm, and that can be really hard, it's painful. Also, their teeth will wear down or they'll break teeth, actually. The, these dystonic spasms are quite powerful oftentimes. Um, and so we can inject the muscles that you know, are involved with that to try to lessen that. Let me just play this movie. So you'll see um, how she's trying to fight to keep her eyes open. She's got some funny lower facial movements. And now here's a movie of her after injections. Her face looks pretty normal there. So it can have marked improvements in um, some of these symptoms. So she could drive after Botox, you know, whereas before that, I mean, nobody in their right mind would get in the car with her. So, anyways, so another um, common time that I uh, do Botox injections for people with Parkinson's is when they have a lot of drooling or sialuria. And so in Parkinson's, as you may know, people lose many of their automatic movements. They don't um, blink their eyes quite as often. They don't automatically swallow as often. So the saliva will pool in their mouth, and then when they're not paying attention, it kind of drips out. And most people, we treat this, we have them, well, chew gum or eat a little candy or drink some water or start talking or something, and that will stimulate the swallow. Sometimes that's not enough, um, and we have to start them on some medicines. Well, many of those medicines are very difficult to tolerate, so oftentimes they're actually contraindicated. Um, and, so, and if so, we can actually use Botox. And now these are people that have drooling, um, not like some of us do at night where, you know, you wake up and your pillow's kind of wet, but this is like their drooling is so severe they're holding a hanky and their T-shirt or shirt will get wet because they're drooling so much. And if we can um, give injections into their salivary glands, we can cause decreased release of the saliva or kind of like decreased production, and that will counteract this inability to swallow. And so the parotid gland is one of our main uh, salivary glands, and so that's one we commonly inject. There's also some under the chin here, the submandibular glands. Those sometimes have a side effect of causing swallowing problems, so I try to stay away from those. But um, anyways, but it can be quite effective um, in treating that. Um, and it doesn't, you know, you think, well, geez, will it dry out the mouth too much? And usually it doesn't, because you do need saliva for uh, protecting your your teeth from cavities and to chew and moisten food, so we don't want to get rid of it 100%. And then some other uses that, you know, are less, you know, I've kind of gone through like the ones that are the most common that have the highest success rate with treatment, and now I'm getting into some that you sometimes, sometimes hear about but might have more limited benefit. Um, if people look up tremors and treatment for tremors, they always list Botox. Well, the type of tremor that responds to Botox is actually a head tremor that's caused by something that most people with 
um, Parkinson's don't have, and it's called cervical dystonia. Um, and so that's a different disease entity. So and those people can have head tremors. So if you have that in a head tremor, Botox might work well. It doesn't, I've tried doing it for chin tremors and that doesn't go particularly well. Um, and of course, everybody was looking for something for their, their arm tremors. And unfortunately, um, it has very limited use for suppressing arm tremors. It usually just causes unnecessary weakness or clumsiness. Um, so it's not really a good treatment for that. There's a few cases where someone might have a certain type of arm tremor that you know we might try it in and they'll get somewhat of a benefit. Another complication of Parkinson's, it's rare but very disabling when it occurs is bent spine syndrome or camptochormia. And so this isn't just the usual, like when you see pictures of Park Parkinsonian people or diagrams, they show the forward flex posture. I mean, these are people who are like bent over like 90, 45 to 90 degree angle. And so they can stand up straight to begin with, or if they lay down on the ground, they can get completely flat. But the longer they stand up or if they start walking, they gradually sink forward. And um, we think that that is in part due to dystonic spasms of the abdominal muscles, as well as there's a, a layer of muscles just um, in front of the spinal column, the spinal bones, that can spasm and cause people to have that abnormal posture. We can't reach those spinal column related muscles because they're too deep in. You'd have to have surgery to do that, but we sometimes see if we can affect this early on by injecting in the abdominal muscles. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but um, it's often you know, worth trying in those people. So the other thing that um, is getting in, it increasingly used is for a hyperactive bladder. So you know in Parkinson's, as well as other things, you, the bladder can get kind of small and rigid. And so then when it fills up with just a little bit of urine, it wants to contract. And you know, of course, it contracts strongly and you're not close to the toilet. And so you leak and have an accident, which is very you know, obviously embarrassing. And so what a urologist can do is go in and inject Botox into the bladder wall and help the bladder relax a little bit so it's not quite so hyperactive. And I'm not sure how our, um, our, our urologists at UW, um, some of them will do that, but I have yet, I, I'm having a hard time figuring out who's a good candidate for that or not. But, you know, that's something that um, sometimes we can refer you to urology for. You want them doing that because they know the anatomy the best. And that's kind of the trick of doing it well is being very familiar with the anatomy. So there's all these things that we can do, of course, and it's like, whoa, that sounds pretty great. But remember, to get your attention at the beginning, I was telling you how lethal Botox is and how dangerous it is. So of course, there's lots of side effects to consider um, and safety issues. And interestingly, even though it's such a poisonous substance, the use of it medically by trained experts is actually really pretty darn safe. Um, the major side effect I have to counsel people about is unintentional weakness. So the Botox might spread to adjacent muscles that we don't want to have affected. And so that, of course, will vary depending on the particular site of the injection. Um, so that's something we counsel people about a lot. Um, sometimes at the injection, well, first of all, the Botox hurts. You know, I'm talking about using needles and injecting in a muscle that spasms. So that's very painful to do. Um, not for me, but for the person getting the Botox. And um, so there can be injection site reactions and bruising and a little muscle soreness um, that occurs with it. Some people uh, with repeated injections will develop antibodies to it. And so then their immune system, when I inject it, their immune system attacks the neurotoxin and deactivates it. So then it's not effective. Um, the, um, the other thing to consider in this day and age is the expense. I always consider a side effect the expense of the medication or this substance. And Botox is very, very expensive. It's a biologically active type of substance. It has to be, um, it's produced by raising the bacteria and, and to make the toxin and collecting it and purifying it and so on and so forth. So it's pretty high tech to produce it. And so that increases the price of it tremendously. So then we run into the problem, anything that's expensive, the insurance companies don't want to pay for. Um, we um, manage that the best we can at UW by trying to um, 
We have uh, our pharmacy will uh, make sure that we get any prior approvals that we need and all that kind of thing. And if they don't approve it, you know, the person should know ahead of time how much it might cost them out of pocket and so forth. So we try to help prevent any financial surprises. <laughs> So what could you expect um, if you were going to, if you're thinking if, you know, or wondering if, oh, maybe this would help, you know, would Botox help this problem that I have? Well, first of all, you're going to want to meet us. And, you know, I do the injections, so does Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Manjin and Dr. Shannon. Um, and, you know, all four of us do these injections. And we'll want to see the abnormal movement or muscle spasm that you're experiencing because you know, we can't do body-wide Botox. Um, and we want to make sure that we can access the muscle um, reasonably, that we can, um, and that um, by accessing it, we're not going to cause more harm. Or if we over weaken things or something, we're not going to cause you a lot of harm. So you need to see us in consultation about these kinds of things. And we talk to you about the risks and that sort of thing. And what are the other alternatives besides Botox? Um, so. Um, we do the injections in the office, and um, you don't need any kind of anesthesia or anything like that. Now, like for bladder injections and stuff, there they do it a little bit differently. But you know, for the first common things that I was talking about, it's just you know regular office visit. Um, it takes a few days, up to a week or so, for the Botox to really do its trick to really inhibit the release at that neuromuscular junction or the number of them, of course, and to, for you to see the results of it. And then the effect of it will last um, several weeks and then can gradually wear off. The neuromuscular junction is going to repair itself and so then your symptoms will come back. So unfortunately that means if I give you a side effect, well that side effect will eventually go away. It might take days or it might take a couple weeks, which is no small thing, but it will go away. But um, so that's the positive. The bad thing is, is that I'll need to do repeat injections on you. And an average spacing of injections is about every three months. We try to tailor it, of course, to the person. And some people need it more often. Some people can go six months, depending on where we're injecting and the response and everything. So. Botox can be frustrating for people because there's variability in the response. You know, it's a biologically active thing. And so, um, you know, we do it as precise as we can, but there is going to be some variability in how the body reacts to it, how that Botox spreads. So the side effects can be different from time to time or the exact effectiveness can vary. And that can be very frustrating, when, you, especially when you're dealing with a painful type of spasm. Um, Sometimes um, you will also see um, people using something called an EMB, EMG machine to um, focus the, and to better isolate the muscle that they're trying to inject. For example, um, if I'm injecting in the arm, all the muscles that control my fingers are all here in my forearm, the meaty part of the arm, and so they're one on top of the other. And so if I want to just affect like one finger and not others, I can use an EMG machine to better do that. Using the EMG machine can help me be more precise. Unfortunately, it, it hurts a heck of a lot more because the needle I use is one that's specially made to record the muscle activity, and I can inject through that needle, but it makes the needle pretty big and kind of painful. So we try try not to do that. Some, some people who have been trained to do Botox, they use the EMG machine for everything. Others of us have been trained otherwise, and we don't always have to use it. So... Yep, some places are starting to use ultrasound. Um, you know, one of the places they try that is in the parotid gland for the drooling, but usually you can feel that. I mean, often, really, I mean, I was trained, and if you know your anatomy well enough, you shouldn't really need to use that, but maybe for deeper structures, that would be something. Um, so at least for in neurology, it's not been a particularly necessary thing, but we might be seeing more of that. 